check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. check, 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 check. It's like a chicken.
All right, Mary Soul's there on the live stream. <clears throat> Let's start with some new things first. Then we'll go back and update some more information. So I'm trying to do more new things on Mondays, Wednesdays, you know, answering questions, looking at everybody's projects. Um, let's come in here and get a lay of the land quickly. Um, we're going to get started on Cinema 4D today. Some of you have used Cinema 4D in the other uh, classes. There we go. So, what are we doing in, why, why use another program? Uh, this Cinema 4D is a 3D authoring environment. So this is where we can make um, 3D shapes. These are gonna be in the form of a mesh that then <clears throat> we can use in a 3D environment in the game. You know, we've done some 3D stuff in Unity, we made the spheres bounce. We, you know, used a capsule, some other business. Um, but all of the things that we used, um, all those simple shapes, those are called primitives. That's not a software specific word, that's just a general shape word, it's a shape primitive. You can have a 3D primitive, which would be a sphere, or you can have a 2D primitive, which would be a circle, right? So in 2D or 3D, we have you know, fundamental shapes. And most programs um, that interact with 3D in any way, or even drawing programs, right? They have, uh, the tools to make primitive shapes because those are the building blocks for more complicated shapes. And so they have um, 3D and 2D primitives and uh, there's you know the default 3D primitives in uh, Unity, but Unity is not a modeling program, okay? The, and again, things come together in Unity and that's where the interactivity happens, where the shading uh, of 3D shapes happens, um, but it's not a place where you make the 3D shape, okay? Uh, it's just not... There's a few tools to use in Unity to make quick edits, but as far as, you know, high-fidelity modeling, that needs to happen somewhere else. Uh, it can happen in any 3D software. We'll use Cinema... I don't know if we'll use any Blender in this class. We'll see. Um, some of you may have used Blender in some of your other classes. Uh, let me grab that one. All right, so both of these are 3D authoring environments for making this. This is the end of the day thing that we need to get out of those environments. We need a mesh. Um, a mesh is going to be made of points, edges, and polygons. If we come back here to Cinema 4D, we look at the sphere. This is a mesh. Um, N, B, N, A. So I know about half of you have been in classes with me before and you've got some Cinema 4D chops. Um, about half of you have not. So I'll probably put a supplemental uh, video that I won't do live here. That's the basic introduction and navigation in Cinema 4D. But I know most of you have that under your hands at this point. But from a conceptual standpoint, in Cinema 4D, we've got our modes, up here, where's my zooming software? There we have our modes. 
these are what am I trying to manipulate? And the most important ones here are the model itself, the whole model, and then just what I was talking about. These three right here, these are points, edges, and polygons. Part of what I like about Cinema 4D is that the, the interface is definitely good, better than many of these programs uh, in terms of, I think it, once you learn a few rules, it makes sense. And additionally, the icon design is in general good, right? You look at this and if you know about points, edges, and polys, these icons definitely communicate that idea. In addition to that, like most programs, if you hover over it, um, it'll you know, tell you what the mode or the button is, and usually something about uh, shortcuts. So points, edges, and polygons. The object itself is over here. These are all the objects in the uh, scene. We're not going to be creating a scene in Cinema. In this class, we're mostly using Cinema to make you know, parts. Um, things. The scene itself will come together in Unity. right? So we're just going to be making individual things that then get uh, put into Unity. Uh, at the end of the day, everything that we do in Cinema 4D is points, edges, and polygons. Okay, All the other tools we'll learn about to help build stuff, they're all one level of abstraction or many levels of abstraction up from that. The whole program is about putting together a mesh where it's points in 3D space connected by edges, and then those edges are filled in by polygons. You can see that here. The most important shortcut in Cinema 4D is C, which is convert from a procedural object to a polygonal. Right, so we go from something that's being created by instructions to something that's being created uh, and editable at its most basic level, its atomic level. So. I'll show that here real quickly with uh, the sphere. I'll hit C. And now it's a polygon mesh, meaning that I have access to these points, edges, and polygons. Before I hit C, if I leave it as a object where the icon looks like a sphere, if I go to points, I can't, or polygons rather, I can't click on a polygon. After I hit C, and then have it selected. Now I can select an individual polygon and I could move said polygon or, or do whatever I would want uh, with that. The, I could also grab an edge or multiple edges, UL for loop select, T, which would scale, so scaling an edge to manipulate the shape itself, and then individual points. Here's a point E. If I grab this point, I could move a single point on this mesh. So you could make any conceivable shape this way, right? Just getting in there and moving point by point around until you had the shape that you would want. You could do that. It would be super, super slow. Um, so there's a bunch of other tools and objects that help you do that in a way that makes you know more uh, sense and is more like how we typically can still conceive of building things, right? When we look at objects, we see basic shapes, and then those shapes are combined. Um, we don't necessarily think of forming a 3D shape out of points that are laid along the surface of the object. So with that in mind, um, you know, this is what we're using Cinema 4D for in order to, you know, create 3D meshes, you know, something beyond the primitives that are available in uh, Unity. So the, let's come back here. Oh, I wanted to show you this. We'll go to
yeah, here we go, the structure manager. You won't need to use this window very often, but I like to just pull it up to show you that this is what's happening underneath the hood, right? So um, the structure manager here, this is the underlying data structure of this object. So I'm in point mode here, and this is literally a list of every point that's part of this sphere and the three-dimensional coordinates for said point, right? So under the hood, this is what it all is. It's a big Excel database, right? Or just database. Um, the, if we looked at uh, polygons, each polygon has a number. Uh, usually you don't need to worry. That's not something you're thinking about, but obviously for the computer to keep it all straight, um, they need to be organized in some sort of list structure. And these polygons here uh, are a list of you know, which points are connected in order to form uh, that particular polygon. So under the hood, that's what's going on, right? Everything gets baked down into that at the end of the day. Uh, great. When we design our meshes, um, just like we did at the beginning, we want to save a C4D file. That's going to be our copy in case we want to go back and make changes later on. We did this week one, except we did it in 2D, right? When I made that shape in Illustrator, I saved the Illustrator file. The Illustrator file was not what I imported into Unity, right? It was the PNG. We have a similar, such, similar situation in 3D where the uh, native format of the 3D software is not what you import. What are we going to import? We're going to import uh, an FBX. An FBX is a file type. It's a 3D mesh file that then uh, this can go directly into Unity, or we may also take it into Substance Painter, which allows us to make a really, uh, to allows us to paint on it in a really, really high fidelity way. Some other 3D mesh file formats to be aware of. FBX is going to be the most important one. Um, there is no perfect standard in terms of, you know, there's a lot of different 3D file formats. And that's just the way it is. There's, you know, different programs that have used different types of files and so on and so forth. Um, so OBJ is another one that's fairly ubiquitous, object file. Um, and then a newer type of file that can go between programs is a, a GLTF file or a GLB file. They're both two flavors of a new format. So all, th all four of these here, these are file formats that you can use usually to get things between 3D programs. But usually 3D programs also have a native file format that you should also save. When you save out to these file formats, in general, that is a destructive act where you're baking down whatever it was you made into a mesh. And if you had to go back and get back to the Cinema 4D state, you could not from the FBX file. That's why we want to have the C4D file saved. And it would be this, the same thing for Blender. Uh, a Blender file is um, a blend, dot blend. And then you can export all these same file formats from Blender as well. So PJ, GLTF, GLB. Mm 
the FBX file. is the output format here. So from Cinema 4D, we output an FBX. Move this line a little bit thicker. There we go. Um, and the FBX file can go directly into your game engine. Okay, whether that's uh, Unity or Unreal. All right, we'll get to Unreal in a bit. But the FBX can come from here and then go into the game engine and then become something in your game, right? The main character, a rock, a tree, the landscape, a cloud, whatever, right? Uh, you can make a 3D shape, bring the shape in. Um, another workflow here is that sometimes the FBX will first go to Substance Painter, right? Adobe Substance Painter. Let's write that down. And why would you want to take it to Adobe Substance Painter? This, you want to essentially paint on the mesh in a very specific way, right? We want part of the mesh to be one kind of material, part of the mesh to be another type of material. Typically, you know, uh, we're going to make sort of a stylized, cartoony looking game here in 3D first. Um, these were going to be hero objects you know, something that needs uh, detail on it. Those objects are going to come into Substance Painter and be able to be manipulated. And then coming out of Substance Painter, we have textures that go on a material in Our game engine. So Substance Painter doesn't do anything to change the mesh. We're creating materials that then get applied over here that allow us to have a lot of control over what's what it's going to look, look like. Now, um, where does the animation happen? Two places. We can animate here in Cinema 4D. Usually, that's a better choice for something like a character. Or complicated mesh. The animation tools in these tools, the animation, you know, uh, yeah, tools in Cinema 4D and Blender are in general better than what we have over here, although, you know, comparable, I mean, not by much. The animation for simple objects makes more sense for that to happen here. Right, if I need to make something spin around, that is by far better to do over here. Why is that? Because if I want to make changes later, I'm in my game engine, and I can just pretty easily you know, change the animation, put a script on there to change the animation speed, so on and so forth. Right, I can make those changes fairly easily. Um, while if I need to change something about the character animation, most of the time, I would need to come back here 
to make that change and then do the export process again. Okay, it's not impossible. It's just another step in the in the chain. Uh, there's more to discuss here, but it's important to realize that this can happen in either place, right? We can set keyframes over here, or we can set keyframes here. In general, I would say probably like 80% of the keyframing and animation we're going to be doing is here, and 20% probably up in Cinema 4D. Okay, does that make sense as far as the lay of the land workflow wise, right? Because I feel like I need to lay this out so that people understand what we're, at least have an idea of what the lay of the land is here. And then also as a justification of like, why do I need to learn these other programs? Um, first of all, I've kind of, you know, I've been doing this for a while. So you always have to learn new programs, right? Like you want to do this. That's part of the gig, um, especially now. It seems like the rate of change is uh, not slowing down, right? So uh, any sort of mental hurdle you have about that, try to contextualize that as part of the gig, right? Um, it's just how things work. Your artistic vision needs to exist outside of the program, right? You have an idea that you want to implement. Of course, the ideas are influenced by the tools, right? There's a give and take there, especially theoretically as the tools get better, the possibility space opens up for your ideas, what you can implement, right? I mean, just now, there's a lot of ideas I've had 10 years ago that I'm just now able to realize because, you know, A, I'm better, and then B, the tools got better. So I can manifest things that were just not either technically or technically or personally feasible before, right? Um, and then in general, the programs are more similar than they are different. There's not a whole lot of programs where this is a completely different paradigm, a new way to think about the thing. There's different buttons to press, quirky stuff, all that kind of thing. But again, that's part of the game. The game be the game. So the that's just part of doing this kind of work. You want to separate that from your vision and your identity as an artist and think of them as tools. There's always that rub when you open up a new tool and there's that week to two weeks of frustration of like, I already know how to do this in this other tool. This is a kind of waste of time, but that's, that's, you know, that is what it is. Uh, once you get over that initial hump, then things really smooth out because you know how to think about the stuff. And in general, if it's a quality tool, the people designing the tool have thought about that. And although their logic and layout may be slightly different, um, most of the time, hopefully, it makes sense uh, once you understand their slightly different take on whatever the underlying principles are. So keep that in mind. But we've got the lay of the land here. Uh, let's look at how this process might work. Uh, so I'll give you guys, I don't think I've given this class this, I'll put it on this assignment for sure. Um, I have a, uh, Cinema 4D default file so that when you do control N to make a new, um, Cinema 4D file, it has some stuff in it. It's got this sphere. It's got some materials. It's got what's labeled over here as a studio, right? So Cinema 4D, again, most almost all of the programs are like this. In fact, every program is like this I can think of, right? You build things in a hierarchy. You have parents and you have children. And so like all of the stuff that's part of the studio, the stuff that makes it look good, uh, I've, I've uh, grouped here into a null called studio. 
and you know there's this backdrop there's a couple lights uh, all of this stuff is just for fun in this class okay uh, it's just to make working in cinema 4d uh, a little more pleasing by default right by default it looks like this the gray void of nothing uh, and I think it's just you know better to work in an environment that looks like something at least uh, and then uh, you know, it just it's just a higher fidelity environment and you know it makes it a lot more fun to work in the however all of this stuff over here I, I don't think we'll spend much time at all in it in this class because none of this stuff comes over right at the end of the day in this class all we're concerned about is getting our shape out of cinema 4d and either into substance painter or into unity and uh all of the texture work and whatnot that's either going to be done in substance painter or in unity so we're primarily just concerned with shape generation here but nevertheless it's better to have a high fidelity work environment and so that's why I've set this up. Uh, once you download the default file that I give you, you just need to open it up and then go to customization. Here it is. Customization set as default scene. So window customization set as default scene. Let's take a picture of that and put it in our thing. Uh, in Cinema 4D, we've got uh, controls in the corners to open up new windows. So we've got this uh, materials over here. Over here, we've got the asset browser. This isn't something we'll access a bunch in this class. And then down here, we've got um our animation view where just like every other animation software just like unity we've got the f curves right where we can come in and edit the curves and we can come in and edit the individual keyframes you guys remember what the name is for the keyframe view that's right dope sheet insert joke about it being some dope sheet right it's just the, the name i actually don't know the it's a it's a like it's a word that comes from hand-drawn animation and i should really know the origin of that i don't Never occurred to me until now. Uh, I'll look it up. I mean, apparently it's also the name for just sort of like a spreadsheet of information. Like one for odds if you're betting on stuff, but maybe that's it. Maybe a lot of our original hand-drawn animators were also gamblers. I was going to say, maybe gambling was more popular back then, but gambling's never been more popular. So, like, there's a higher chance that you guys are gamblers, I guess, than they were. Gamblers? Yeah? No. 
the so let's um let's do this i'm going to delete the sphere so i'll just select the sphere and press delete i'll come over here and grab a cube and we'll do some stuff with this cube uh, if you make a new object that's super bright white um you can put a material on it while you're working over here i'm going to grab the blue one and put it on actually i'm going to grab the pink one and put it on so that we can see what we're doing there we go and nb and na are really important here so nb is going to show the lines the word you need to memorize here is that we have a shape and like i said across the surface of the shape we have points edges and polygons and the whole game here is about arranging those in an efficient way and in a way that makes sense across the surface of the object and that is called topology okay topology is the layout of geez, of polygons okay let me demonstrate it with the sphere I deleted that sphere too soon Okay, so here's a sphere, and we have a layout of polygons across the, across the surface of this. This makes reasonable sense. It kind of looks like how you would see a globe laid out in many, many instances, right? We kind of have a pole and then a pole. Another word to learn, this is actually called a pole in 3D modeling, the very top one, the very top point there. Why is this a pole? There's more than four edges coming together at this point that's called a pole if you look at all of the other points along the surface of this sphere it's always four and four because the best kind of polygon is a quad if you had to guess how many sides does a quad have four right this is if, if your whole if your whole object is made of quads, that's great. Um, they're going to deform better. There's a bunch of reasons in terms of modeling and texturing that quads are going to be preferable. But they're not. it's not possible to always represent the object completely with, with quads. And so occasionally, depending on the topology, you have a layout like this, where we've got a pull at the top. Now, if I come into the sphere and come down here, this is the attributes menu. These are the different tabs. By far, the most important tabs are this one, coordinates, which is exactly what it says it is. This is the transform properties, position, rotation, and scale. And then object. The object tab is going to change depending on the object. It's going to show whatever the different uh, whatever the different options are for that object. And so here under type, we see different layouts for the topology. So what we have right now is standard. Here is tetrahedron. So we still have a sphere, but the layout of the polygons across the surface, the topology is different. Here's a hexahedron. This one is particularly useful. If you look at it, we've got more of like a volleyball-ish sort of look. <laughs> also importantly, this kind of has six sides. We have a top, side, 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 and bottom, very much like a cube. We have an octahedron where it's made up of just uh, triangles and, or no, the icosahedron is only triangles. The octahedron is some other layout. But if I were to turn up the number of segments, notice that this is doing something important. It is smoothing out the sphere. More segments means a smoother sphere. So why not always just crank this number up? Because we need to be efficient. It's more work for the computer to draw more polygons. More polygons, more work. Emily, you're in 185 right now, right? Am I? Yeah, okay, right. So in 185, 
this is important, but it's not a game changer. Whereas here, like literally, pun intended, I guess, it is a game changer, right? Because we're putting this into a game, we need to render in real time, right? How long do you have to render a frame in a game? One sixtieth of a second, right? That's our target frame rate, usually for most games, right? Much faster than the, the, that's the playback, right? And so the computer needs to render the whole frame in one sixty of a second. It's actually less time than that because in between frames, not only does it do the rendering, the drawing on screen, it's doing all the logic, all of the what happened in the game. Like this thing moved, that thing hit this thing, all of that stuff takes up time. And then in addition, uh, part of that time needs to be drawing the stuff on the screen. Uh, I'll show you guys the, the breakdown in Unity. You can actually see a graph, all, all, this, all the stuff that happens every you know, 60 times a second in the game. Um, now, this is the ideal. If we put too many polygons in our game, then this is going to tank. Um, will fall below 60 frames per second, at which point the reaction in the game will not be as immediate. Okay, now, there is a big amount of gradation here, right? Um, the part where I just told you it's 160 of a second, I lied. Right? So it's actually variable. You can tell Unity to either lock to 60 or just try and run as fast as possible. In which case, if the game is simple, it may be rendering as many as like 100 or 300 frames per second. And, um, but that's one of the big things that's different about this class in 184 is that the frame rate can be variable. And in general, this starts to become a problem when we start talking about uh, scaling things, right? Is it possible for you to make one mesh that's going to really make the game not fast? Maybe. The computers are really fast now, okay? So where this would be a problem is like, let's say you made a rock that had way too many polygons on it. And then you put that rock in your level like 500 times. That's where this starts to become a problem, right? Because if you would just have one rock that maybe wasn't modeled so hot and you threw it in there, chances are in most instances, it's not going to um, you know, tank the whole game. But if you take something that's not that great and then you put it in there and repeat it a hundred times, then that becomes a problem. Okay, this is, you'll hear me refer to this often this is a, a first principle mindset that, you know, efficiency at scale, meaning when you repeat something many, 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 many times, becomes that much more critical, right? Running is like this. The problems that you run into running three miles is, you know, whatever. If your knee hurts a little bit at the end of three miles, that's fine. Usually you can, can gut that out. But when you jump to the 26.2 miles for the marathon, the problems that you're having over three miles compound over each subsequent three miles. And so by the time you would get to the end, if you got to the end of the 26.2, that would be a much, much bigger problem. And so this is what you need to consider. So your brain, a, a light bulb should go off when you're designing something. You're like, you know, this is a, a tree. So this is going to be in my game a lot. I got to make sure that this is not something that's going to be a huge problem. So um, that's why we can't just crank this up. But there is the, the fundamental principle here that more polygons are going to lead to a smoother surface. How smooth does this surface need to be? It's going to be a balance of two things. Um, or one thing, really, it's size in the frame, on the screen. 
if it's bigger in the frame, it's going to need more polys, right, to appear smoother. This is for an object that has a curve to it. If the object is flat, we can represent a flat object very well with just one polygon, right? We can make flat polygons pretty easily. Um, and so the if this were something that's going to be, if this was a golf game, right? And this was going to be the model for the golf ball. And, you know, the game is at human scale or whatever, right? We're playing from the point of view of a human. And this was the golf ball, right? This right there. That's probably enough polygons to represent the golf ball, right? Whereas if this is, you know, some sort of, you got hired by Disney to do an Epcot Center interactive um, VR experience, and this is going to be the model for Epcot Center, you know, which is a giant tetrahedron looking building um, that's going to, you know, be very, very large in the frame at all times, then this is something that's going to need many more polygons to properly represent smoothness because it's going to be much, much bigger in the frame all the time. So something like tiny pebbles that sit on the ground are definitely not going to need that much detail, right? Whereas the landscape of your game, that's going to need a lot more detail, a lot more polygons. So, um, yeah, topology. The layout of these matters a lot. And a good rule here, let's put it in here. Objects larger in the frame require more polygonal detail. Fewer polygons will run faster. And let's make a mental note of that. What is our budget? One sixtieth of a second. Right when it comes down to optimizing the game, there's a literal budget of time. How much time can we devote to doing this job in the game? Right as far as calculating something, and that budget is usually measured in milliseconds. How many milliseconds in a second? 1,000 per second. And then topology, the layout of polygons, it should follow the shape. That's going to make our um, everybody's job easier when it does indeed follow the shape. So we'll continue to add to this list, but this is how I work, right? I try to, this type of thinking uh, is now properly referred to as first principles. What are the things that we know are ground truths about what it is that we're trying to do that should guide our decision making every step of the way. And so this is how I think about these things. I try to determine what my first principles are for whatever it is I'm trying to do, and then allow those first principles to guide my step-by-step -step strategic and tactical <clears throat> design.
Okay, now we've discussed a little bit of that. Let's go back to that cube I made before. Bring this cube up. I'll put the pink one on it just for for the time being. And now we're going to make a, a platform. Okay, so just like a generic platform that will bring into Unity as a way to uh, demonstrate a few things. So when I have the cube selected, right now the cube is a primitive. It's not a polygon object. So if I were to click on points, edges, or polys, I can't select this point because I have not selected the cube and pressed C. The second most important shortcut in Cinema 4D, Shift C. Shift C brings up what they call the, what do they call this now? The commander. Uh, the commander allows you to search for anything. So you don't need to remember any other shortcuts or any of the other objects. You just need to remember to shift C and then you can search for them. Um, I'm gonna make sure that I stay in object mode here. And then ERT, just like in Unity, goes back and forth between my move, rotate, and scale. That should all look familiar, right? Again, all the, all the programs have move, rotate, and scale tools. They generally look like this, uh, so you can tell what's going on. Also, good news is that the colors of the axes are the same. So blue is which axis? Z, red, and green, Y. Right? Every program we've, as a culture, we have decided that those are the colors. So that makes uh, this much easier. When I have the cube selected, I'm in model mode. If I click and drag one of these yellow dots, it allows me to adjust that specific primitive. This is different than scaling, okay? This is going to be a little bit confusing for those of you without experience at first. If I press T, and start to scale this, even if I grab just one, I'm not scaling just in that direction, I'm scaling the whole thing. Why is that? Because the object is still a primitive, okay? This may seem just annoying at first. There's a good reason for this. And so if you wanna adjust the size of it at first, it's much better to select it, and you could either come in here and adjust the size by clicking and dragging, or you could grab these yellow dots and move. Again, the yellow dots will not appear if you're in one of the other modes, want to be in object mode, right? They are controls for that object. Let's look at our sphere to look at its controls. If I select the sphere and look at this, it only has one yellow dot. Why is that? If we look at the sphere, object, it doesn't have width, height, and depth. It only has radius, right? Because that's how you calculate a sphere. You just use radius. You're not using the width, height, and depth of it. And again, I could do that over here, or I could click on the yellow dot over here to change its size. size. Cool. All right. So let's give this cube some sort of you know, reasonable size to make it, um, to make, you know, doing math a little bit easier. And so I'm going to say 200 centimeters by uh, 200 centimeters by maybe 10. There we go. That's a reasonable looking platform. As far as like, well, how big is a centimeter going to be in Unity? Um, we don't need to worry about that so much right now. Okay. So more of the relative size, not the absolute size. This is a, more of an issue right now. Cool. Okay, so I've got uh, this platform here, and I want to put you know a lip around the platform. And so I'm going to grab the cube and press C. And so now I can go into polygon mode and make some changes. So I've select the cube. Notice that once we hit C, the icon changes. 
this is the icon for a polygonal object, right? It's now something where I can manipulate the individual polygons. It's also important to note, and it may seem annoying at first, but there's good reason for this. Once you hit C, it is a one-way trip. Can't go back to the object because we're going to manipulate the fundamental mesh and no longer will it be whatever that object was. This may take a little while to sink in, but I'm going to go to the selection tool, object mode, or sorry, polygon mode, select the object, and I'm going to select the polygons by just clicking and then holding down shift. I'm going to select the ones around the edge. Control, hold down middle mouse button, changes the size of the select. Um, again, hold down shift. I'm just getting the ones on the edge like that. And when they're selected in Cinema 4D, you'll see uh, it's, it'll be orange. That is orange tint to it. And let's learn two tools that we'll need. D in Cinema 4D is the shortcut for extrude. And I is going to be inner extrude for inset. You'll see both those words used. So I'm going to press D. And then I'm not going to click on the gizmo. I'm going to click and drag over here in space. Watch what happens. Click and drag. And it drags out the edge over there. Uh, with the tool options now that I see, I can dial this in. So if I wanted it to be exactly 10 centimeters, I can make it very precise. And I don't want to do it twice. Every time I click and drag, it makes a new extrusion. I'm adding more polygons to the object. And so I really only want to do it once there. And a couple other shortcuts here. Let's put these in our list. Commander, search for anything. Uh, e, R, T. It's going to be move, rotate, scale. And then D is going to be the extrude tool. In order to use D, it needs to be polygonal. And then I is going to be the inset tool. In order to do that, also needs polygonal. Right? These are all polygon modeling tools, and so they need to be polygonal object in order to do that. Two more here. There's a lot of um, shortcuts in Cinema 4D that are pressing one letter and then pressing another. In order to select things, you press U, and so UL is going to be loop selection. That one's going to be useful. U, W is going to be select connected. And then you know, holding down shift allows you to you know, throw the selection. And our 3D navigation is the same. Alt left, alt middle, alt right. That's kind of the same, although Blender is different by default. Great. And so now I want to create this lip on this platform. So I'm going to go UL. 
So in Sim 4D, it's nice if you press U, then it shows this menu of what happens with the next letter that you press. These are all the different types of selections you can make here. And so if you forget, you can say loop selection. And so U and then L. And so now when I mouse over this, you see it's trying to find a loop around the object. Um, again, I'm in polygon mode. If I were in edge mode, it would try to find a loop of edges. Uh, if I were in point mode, it would do the same thing for points. Right now we're just concerned with um, polygons. And so here I can put these selections together by holding down shift. I'm gonna go shift and then get those top ones, shift and get the bottom ones, and then shift and get the edge ones. And so I have all of those polygons I just made along the edge. And now I can go ahead and press D again for extrude and then click and drag. And you see how this extrudes out in all those directions, up from the polygons that are along the top, out from the polygons that were around the side and down from the ones that are around the bottom. This is good, right? So I can make this lip that I was trying to make on the edge of the object like so. I can come in here after I'm done and adjust the size to exactly two centimeters just so that it just makes it easier later if you're able to use numbers to make the math easier later on. It's not easier for the computer. The computer doesn't necessarily care if it's 2 or 1.8735, but it definitely makes it easier on you as a designer to know that like, okay, well I made that lip, you know, two centimeters big before, then in order to make this object look similarly, I want to have the same kind of lip on it. Cool. And so now I've got this platform. This makes sense as something we could use in a game. Let's save it. File, save project as. I'm going to go to my folder. I saved the C4D file. And that's pretty good. Let's get this through. Actually, let's do one more thing. We've got the cube here. Uh, I am going to uh, just go to the select tool and click to deselect anything. So I just have just the platform here. And let's go ahead and make um, one of the other first principles here is that in order to make the objects look better in that the way they interact with light, we want to have beveled corners. Let me demonstrate. I'm going to duplicate this. I'm going to double click. I can rename it to platform. There we go. And now I'm going to control drag. Let's write that one down. Control drag. Is copy drag. It allows me to easily duplicate objects in Sim 4D. Shift drag. Is snap or Quantize is the fancy math word. Allows you to snap it, right? So here, I'll go back to object mode. I'm getting out of polygon mode because I want to manipulate the whole object. And so if I hold down control, then I click and drag, watch what happens. I'm making a duplicate. Now, if I let go of the mouse first, then control, now I have an extra object. 
shift drag works like this. If I hold down, if I start dragging and press shift, it locks it to five centimeter increments. It snaps it to five centimeter increments. You can also use them together. I could start dragging and then hold down control and shift. And now I'm duplicating something exactly and snapping it at the same time. Right now, I just want to duplicate so I can demonstrate something. I want to bevel and beveled edges. One of the ways that we can do this, there's many different ways, but one of the most used ways is going to come over here in the purple menu. And this is a deformer. But like I said, you can search for anything. I'm going to go shift C and use the commander and go bevel. This will allow us to This is not going to work. Now they expanded it so it's through it so it's better. It searches all the things in the um Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why that was so slow. I, I think it's just on the school computer. Here should be work to split. Let's look at this. Okay, so I search for bevel. That's great, but it gave me a whole bunch of stuff here. So which one do I want? You, for right now, you want the purple one. The purple one is a deformer. It allows you to change existing geometry. The orange ones are going to be tools or uh, node operators, which are something we don't need to talk about right now. And the other ones here are um, some presets. And so I am going to shift C, bevel, and double click on the purple one. Cool. This gives me a bevel. And in order for this to work, I need to make it a child of the platform. And so I'll select the bevel. I'm holding down the button. I'll drag over the platform. And you see how the arrow points down? That means it's going to make it a child. That's exactly how Unity works, right? And now we look over here. This is what I've been talking about. This is a beveled edge. See what it did? It took the edge that was perfectly sharp. And now created a new geometry along the edge. The reason that this is important is because even if you want this, the edge to be quote unquote sharp, in computer graphics, if you don't bevel the edge, the edge is kind of impossibly, it's mathematically perfectly sharp. So sharp that there's actually no substance Substance will mean something. There's no stuff on the edge that would actually catch light. In real life, this doesn't really happen, right? Because it's impossible to make something so sharp that it wouldn't reflect the light in that way. Uh, by creating this beveled edge, he has these rounded quarters. And you can see right now, right? See how over here? Now, this edge is, is catching the light. If I go NA and turn off the polygon view, you can see how light is interacting with this platform in a way which is, you know, somewhat more realistic, but we're not going for hyper realism right here. It's more just a basic level of fidelity. Um, some students immediately recognize this as being, you know, kind of a retro slash low poly look. Oh, that's, you know, how old video games were looked. The reason they looked like that is because there, you couldn't show enough polygons that you could bevel the surfaces. Um, as technology has gotten better the last 10 years, the last 50 years, we're able to show more polygons on screen. And so the very first games weren't able to do this, and so things looked like that. In general, we're not trying to do that now. right? We're making something that has a higher fidelity look to it. So everybody does see the difference here, right? This is not beveled. This is beveled. For right now, this, what is going on here?
this is better over here. Right? This is what we're going for. I'm not saying that making a retro game is artistically bankrupt. I'm saying as potential employees, it's it's certainly problematic if you're trying to get a job at a place that makes high fidelity things, if your portfolio is all stuff that looks old or looks bad, but on purpose, right? Like, um, unless you're also going to work at a company that only makes retro looking things, that may not be your best route, right? So we're gonna make things that have a bevel on them. The amount of beveling here is going to be a matter of a few things. Let's go ahead and um, delete this one. Look at this one. I want to move it back to the center. And so I'm going to select it and press Alt-0, which centers it back to the center of the screen. Let's put some more on the list here. So Alt-0 is going to zero out the transform and alt G will uh, group things together. Not ground. Group. I'm going to select the bevel and Let's say, I'm going to click this box down here. I'm going to break rounding for now. Grab this tag and make sure that it's catching the light on the edge. Cool. OK, so now I have a platform I think is ready for the game. I'm going to save again. I'm going to come over here to the platform, and how do I export? Over here in the file menu, I can go to I can select the the, uh, the actual object, and then go to File and Export Selected Object As. Again, we're confronted with the confusing world of 3D file formats, and which one do we want? FBX, right. Okay, so I, I just called out a few. Every program has its own format. There's all sorts of other, for, like it's really, there's a lot of them out there. But FBX in general will get you from one thing to another most of the time. File, export selected object as FBX. So, okay. And there we go. And let's come back over here. And I'm going to make a new scene. I'm in the same project. It's going to be my 3D test scene. There we go. And now we need another new folder. Right click and say folder. And this is going to be mesh. Meshes. And we can bring in the platform. Okay, so here, if you're on a Windows computer, this will be the FBX. This is the C4D. Okay, so this, if I need to go back and change it in any way, you know, like the, my art director comes back and says, looks great. Can you put a post in the middle of it? And then you come back to the C4D file, you press I, you press D, and there you go, right? You got a post in the middle of it. Um, the FBX file is the one that needs to come into Unity, right? So in the meshes folder, I can just drag this in here and let go. And you should see it pop up with, um, you know, with the preview here that uh, looks like the, the actual thing. And in order to get into the game, you can just do that. And so now, all I did was drag from here to uh, there. And so that puts it in the game. 
if I unfold over here, um, we've got this. We have a null at the top. You see that there's no stuff here. And underneath, we've got um, something that has a transform component, just like every game object. This in Unity is confusingly named the mesh filter. The mesh filter is actually where the you know mesh data is. It's not filtering anything out that's per se. It's where the data is. If you click on the mesh filter, it'll show the other mesh meshes in the project. If you click on it, you'll see the other um, default meshes and anything else that you have imported. And then the mesh renderer, right? Remember, render means to draw. And so this is the thing that's actually drawing the mesh on screen. If I turn this off, it's still there. It's just not being rendered on screen, just like the sprite renderer. And in the mesh renderer, that's where we would apply materials. And so I'm going to turn off 2D here so I can look at this, press F to zoom in. There we go. And so if I go to my, uh, I need a folder, right click, folder, this is going to be materials. And all these materials I've made so far, I'm just going to drag them and dump them in the materials folder. Not the physics material. So let's go in here into the materials folder. Right, and I can apply a material to this just by simply dragging it on there, like so. Or if I select the object and go to the materials drop down and click here, it'll show me the materials that are in my project. And I could apply them to the object. These are super simple materials. If we un if we double click the material, um, this allows us to make changes to it. The material applied to the object, if it changes all the objects that have that material selected, change as well. So if I duplicate this thing, here I have two platforms now. Um, I want the game view to be better. I'm going to come up to the camera and let's list another good shortcut here. Control Shift F, which is snap object to scene view. This is particularly useful for the camera. It allows you to move the game camera to the scene camera position. So, uh, you know, this allows me to see the bevels and see everything that's going on with my object. The default game view over here is that it's way over there. I could just grab the main camera and start messing around with the transform and try to move it closer to the thing, like so. Or I could select the main camera, come over here, navigate to where I want to see it, and then press Control Shift F. And that snaps the game, the camera, main camera object to the view that's right here, right? This view is the scene camera. The scene camera is not an object. It's not in the game. It's just where you're currently looking at stuff. Um, so that makes that a little bit easier. Cool. Now, both of these objects have the, have the same material applied. If I come and make changes to that material, both of them 
change because they both have the same material selected right now. And our material settings here, we have our color and then how metal the object is, right? So if it's all the way over on the left, it's much more plastic-like. If it's all the way over on the right, it's much more metallic looking. Smoothness is going to be very dull if it's all the way over on the left and very smooth or shiny if it's all the way over on the right. And so you could have a, um, you know, if it's completely metal, you can have a shiny metal or a dull metal. Or if it's all the way plastic, you could have a shiny plastic or a dull plastic, right? So there's a balance there between both of those uh, sliders. And then the color. Now, uh, I think we did this. Yeah, I did this. To, didn't I bring in that checkerboard? I may have brought it in the other one. Is it on my... There it is. Okay, so I'm going to come back here. Well, let's go to the materials folder and I'm going to bring in this PNG file, this checker. And uh, this is not one I'm going to use as a sprite, right? So this is important to realize the most often two ways we're going to use a PNG file, which is going to be a 2D image, is one as a sprite. We've already done that a bunch. Or you can use it as a texture, which means you're going to wrap it around a mesh. In terms of the PNG, what's different about the PNG when you use it one way versus the other? Nothing. Okay, it's just a PNG file. You need to tell Unity what it is you're going to do with this, right? And so here, instead of coming over here and saying Sprite, I'm just going to leave it as default, which allows me to drag it here and apply it to the surface of this object and put it back to white so we can see that. Right. And so now I have this checkerboard pattern applied to my object. Now down here, the tiling and offset matter. Right. So if I wanted it to have more checks, I could put it at like five tab five. And now you see it it applies it, but it's kind of strange right now. Um, it seems to work as one would hope on top, right? It creates this sort of chessboard looking uh, top and bottom. And on the side, okay, I can see what's happening there. But for some reason, we're not tiled here and on the other side. And there's a reason for that, which we'll get to in a second. But I'm able to apply that to this... Uh, color in the material there. I'm going to get rid of it here. So I'll just select the little circle next to it and then say uh, none. And now um, that's what happens, and that makes sense when we apply it to the you know base color. However, you can apply it to now the normal here is going to be yeah. well we'll throw it on there you can also use textures on some of the other parameters this is going to look strange 
for right now. If I apply it to the map, you see now we just get one slider. Let's not worry about that for right now. It's a little bit more complicated of an issue. Um, let's put it on the height map and take this one and put it on the height. And um, there's a slider next to this. And watch what happens as I dial in the slider here. Height. Yeah, we'll bring that in after substance pain. Okay, we'll just leave it at that for now. We can bring it in. The point I wanted to make was that if we put this on there, we're able to apply a texture to it. The way that it applies may not be exactly what we want because we've got to do a few things when we're constructing the model. There's some other stuff here, like here's that teacup. You know, I could use that. See that now that appears. Right. This is just like a sprite sheet for emojis, and I haven't set it to be a sprite sheet yet, and so I'm just using it as a texture. And you can see that this gets applied across the surface of the object. That's good for now. Let's take that off. Here. But even with that applied, I still have in individual controls whether I want it to look more metallic, more smooth, or rough. And if I want to get rid of it, selecting there, and going up to none, allows me to get rid of that. Now, this we're using as a texture, and we should probably have another folder for that. So right click and say, create folder, let's make textures. And I'll grab that material and put it in that textures folder. So separating out sprites from textures. They're both going to be PNG files, but we have to specifically tell Unity when it's a sprite uh, versus when it's a texture. Make sense so far? You both have some experience with C4D, so that nothing was ground earth shattering here, right? OK. Um, so we have the FBX over here. Let's talk about the few of the issues, right? Uh, artistically, what do we want to do here? Well, we made this lip. I think it would probably look best if we were able to have one color here and a, another color over there, right, uh, as far as it looking. Um, you know, more interesting, right? If we have the lip be a separate color from the other part. Uh, we need to do a few things back here to make that happen. And uh, let's do that. First of all, let's uh, come up with the workflow. So that one part I told you where I just right click and export object as, we want to do a few things here first. That, when I did that, it, it worked fine, right? We got something in there, but uh, what what was undesirable about it? Uh, it imported, but imp it imported as this like two level thing, where there's a parent object and then the sub parent object. And part of the reason for that is the fact that this has that deformer on it. And we're going to want to do a few things to make this workflow. A little bit longer right now, but this will pay dividends later on. And so this part here, where we are exporting from here to there, let's come up with a list of things. 
one, we are going to want to connect objects so that everything that is changing our mesh is baked down into a single mesh object. Then we're going to need to UV unwrap the mesh and then we can import to substance or image. And this is the object export workflow. Let's do that here. Okay. So this is a very, very simple hierarchy. We've got the bevel operating on this platform. Things can get much more complicated. Okay, we could have um, any other number of things in here that could be multiple deformers. Like here's one called Spherify, which kind of takes something and makes it more sphere-like, doesn't do a whole lot in this particular instance. You could have any number of these working on your object. Right here's a twist. We fit that and then, you know, twist. You get a bunch of garbage there, but you can have many, many, many objects all working together here. You could have parent objects. One of the most common workflows is throwing it inside a subdivision surface, which you see kind of smooths it out in another way that we'll discuss in more detail later on. But this is how it works when you're making more complicated things in C4D. We end up with this large, big hierarchy of stuff. And what we want to do there is Select the top object, right click, and select Connect Objects. So you don't want Connect Objects and Delete. That's going to delete the original one. We just want Connect Objects. So right click. Connect objects. Now we get a duplicate, but it doesn't have the bevel in there. See that? If I were to turn off by making this red red, by double clicking on the in Cinema 4D, these are called the traffic lights. The top one is is it viewable in the editor? And the bottom one is is it viewable in the render? We don't care about rendering. We're not going to render anything out of C4D. We're just exporting meshes out of C4D. But um, now I'm just looking at the top platform, and we'll call this the platform baked, right? It's been baked down into just the mesh. If I look at it now, the bevel is there, right? Because the bevel is no longer being generated by this object, the output of that generation, that procedural object, has been printed into this mesh now. And so this is the whole thing. So this is what you want your C4D files to look like, is that you have the one that you're working on, where there'll be a bunch of Cinema 4D modifiers and deformers and other things. And then once you're done and you reach the end of the process, you'll connect objects so that you get down to a single mesh. And in that mesh, this is the one that's going to get exported, and this is the one that is going to get UV unwrapped. What is UV unwrapping? I'm going to kind of gloss over it for today. It'll just be some button clicking. But as we go on, this will be more, we'll spend some more time on it. The good news is, that especially for like the simple objects that we're making here at the beginning, Cinema 4D will do some um, automatic UV unwrapping for us, which should work fine. So where do we go to UV unwrap something? under UV edit. So let's take a picture of that. So 
I'll select the object. I'll go into polygon mode. I'll go to UV edit. And I want to UV unwrap this object. Here's the sequence of things right now. I'm going to select it. I go to polygon mode. First, I'm going to pre uh, tell it to reset the UVs, which should actually, sorry. First thing you're going to do is go to polygon mode and press control A. So we want to make sure that the mesh is selected. We want to make sure that we are in polygon mode. Then we press control A. Your whole object should light up orange. And then we say reset. Everything should disappear over there because we've just essentially deleted the UVs. And then under automatic UV unwrapping, we can go to pack apply. And this is all of the polygons in our object laid out in 2D space. So this is how it's going to apply when we apply the texture. Um, these are the different algorithms. If you want to try different automatic algorithms, you would select one, press reset, select the other, apply, and you can see how they give slightly different layouts. Um, let's leave it at that for now. Let's do the packed one. So I'll select packed, I'll go to reset, and then I'll press apply. We'll talk more about this layer, but for right now, we just need a usable UV map. And for the simple type of things we're making, that should work just fine. So now I'm going to take the platform up here and export it again as FBX. Also, when you export as FBX, this is a big one. We want to make sure the camera and lights are unchecked. Let's put that in our list. Otherwise, they come into Unity, which is a bummer. Mine was, once you uncheck it, it should stay unchecked. Um, And what do we need here? We need to go to UV unwrap mode, select the mesh object, make sure you go into polygon mode, then control A for select all, then reset UVs, and then automatic, and then apply. It's a lot to remember a bunch of steps the first time, but once we do it more and more often, I'll get used to it. Cool. Let's export this again. File, export selected object as FBX, no cameras, no lights. OK. And so now, platform baked, bring this in here. And we'll bring it in so we can see the difference. And I'll bring this one in. And let's take our material that we're using. I'm going to put that checkerboard back on it so we can see.
cool. So both of these platforms have the checkerboard applied, the exact same material applied. Why does it look different on one versus the other? Um, because this object was not UV unwrapped. So there was no information in the mesh. The UVs are stored in, in the FBX. In, in Cinema 4D, the UV information is stored in this tag, the checkerboard looking tag. That's where that's stored, so don't delete that tag. Um, and then they're packaged up. Uh, before, when I was telling you that we export the mesh, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. It's the big, it's the big database of the points, edges, and polys. There's also UV information. There can be some other stuff dumped into that file. And so now we have them both in here. And you can see what's going on here. This is a lot more desirable, right? Because we have the entire object. The material is now spreading out across the entire surface. Whereas over here, there was nothing we could do to put the material on this part of it because these polygons, because we didn't UV unwrap the object, were not represented in the UV map. And so the UV map is the way that the pixels are applied to the polygons. That's a good way to put it, UV. It's how we put the pixels on the polys. Right? What are the pixels, the textures that we bring in to throw on there? And without a plan for how to apply pixels to the polys, then we can end up in situations like this, where we have things that we seemingly can't put a texture on in addition to a bunch of other issues. There. And so both of these have the same thing applied there. Cool. Now, uh, yeah, don't be thrown off by this. We'll get to this later. Uh, when I was adjusting the tiling, I'm adjusting it up here under surface inputs, not under the detail input, which is a separate thing. We're not going to deal with that for right now. Uh, so I was just adjusting it up there. OK, so if you're not completely understanding UVs right now, that's OK. We'll be doing it more and more, and I think it'll become clear. But let's do the full workflow ones here with this object, OK? So right now, this would be fine you know, if this was the end state of my object. Right? I just needed to sort of evenly spread some sort of texture across the surface. And I could come in and make the change on the tiling and the metallic, but we want to make this a more high fidelity asset where we're going to actually control the surface and the best place to do all that work is Substance Painter, right? Adobe Substance Painter, you should have downloaded it the very first week. It was in the tech login challenge. It's in your Adobe Creative Cloud. And so let's open up Substance Painter. Substance Painter, we're going to need, what are we going to bring into Substance Painter? We're going to bring in the FBX. Right, so just like we said at the beginning of class, up until now, we've been taking this route where we just send it to our game engine. Now we're going to take this route where we go to Painter first and then over here in order to do something more interesting and high fidelity with the object. So let's do that. Remember to bring your parka, your blanket, one of those hats. What do you call those hats? The, the big, you know, hats you made out of 
like they wear in Alaska with the flap, ear flaps and the, there's a name for those hats, I can't remember what's that. Being a Phoenician, I don't own one or really talk about them on a regular basis. So if you haven't been into class, you got to come in just once for the experience. It's kind of like braving the Arctic. It's so cold in here. So, substance painter. The basic gist of substance painter is this, right? We've got these materials, right? Let's say I wanted to make this green and this red. It'd be great to be able to paint this part green, paint that part red. You know, and this is what Substance Painter is doing. It allows you to paint materials onto the surface of the object, surface of the mesh. Um, it does way more than that, but that's sort of the, pro the value proposition at the beginning. I'm in Substance Painter. I'm going to go to File, New, and I will grab not the C4D. I will grab the FBX, so the 200 platform baked, right? The one with UVs. And then two things. You want to make sure auto unwrap is unchecked. You want to make sure that this is set to 2048 for now. And down under color management, let's say Adobe Ace, and then say, okay. Uh, actually, yeah, and I imported the proper FBX. Say, okay. Cool. More good news. Navigating around in Substance Painter is the same as the other programs. So left, alt, left, alt, middle, alt, right. Allows me to zoom in, move, or orbit the camera. And we should recognize this now. You know, this is our object over here. This is the mesh. And then what, what's over here? What are these things? The UV map, right, uh, for our object over here. And... A good way to conceptually think of Substance Painter is it's like Photoshop for meshes. That's the, I think, easiest way to think of the program to start off. Over here, we have layers, just like in Photoshop. So for instance, I've got all these materials over here that I can use on my object. And so you may not have the exact same materials that I have over here. I've imported some. We'll talk about where to get them, a bunch of other things later on. But for instance, we have layers. I could, you know, like here's this pebble material. I'll drag this over here to make a layer out of it. This layer is a fill layer. It essentially fills up the entire thing. And so now, you know, the whole thing looks like pebbles. One of the things we could do on this layer is adjust the tiling. You know, if we wanted it to be a denser array of pebbles over here. Um, and these are layers, just like layers in Photoshop. So if I put another one over here that's uh, paint. Now we see it covered up the pebbles in terms of color. It didn't cover up the pebble pattern. There's some other things to address here. Um, you can turn layers on and off with the you know, eye. And so here's the paint layer by itself. Okay. You see it's not just paint. There's a few other things going on. It's got like some texture to it um, in that we have I forget what the I'll look it up later. Um, so I've got this layer here. As I drag these materials over, I grab this brushed metal, put it up here. First of all, you can see that the variety of starting points here, the, you're not limited to these materials. You can expand the list, you can bring in other things. You can bring in your own images. It's a lot to do here. But these are, think of them all as starting points. You, you have a much richer array of starting points here to start with texturing the whole thing. Second, um, 
These can be manip manipulated in a variety of ways. Uh, every time I bring one of these over, it's creating a whole new layer. And this is a specific type of layer. It is a fill layer, meaning it fills up the entire thing. If I were to grab something else over here, this fabric, and put that on top. There we go. Now it looks like, you know, it's knit. Um, and as I turn them off, it reveals the layer underneath. These are all fill layers. There's a second type of layer right here. And this is a paint layer. This allows you to paint onto the object. So for instance, if I make a new paint layer, there we go. And I can double click and name my layers just like Photoshop. We'll call this, you know, test paint for now. And what this is going to do by default here is that uh, if I select a material, Don't crash, don't crash. Okay, I got everything running at the same time. Probably don't do that, right? So uh, like literally everything, and then I'm also streaming a little too much. Um, you know, like the, here, let's save cinema and at least take that off the table, right? All of these programs that we use are, you know, using way more of your computer than you are when you're writing papers. So it does influence the uh, performance. Okay, so I made a, a paint layer. Now I selected a material. We'll get this gold metal. And now if I click and drag on the surface of my object, I can paint in gold wherever I would want. Now the knit pattern is still showing through down there for some reasons that we'll get to in a second, but I could pick some other, this rock and paint, you know, like a rock pattern on there. It doesn't work particularly well in this instance, but you can see what's going on there. I'm able to paint. Now this default method of painting, where I'm just sort of scribbling with my mouse here, this isn't entirely useful. I don't use this, you know, very often. There's a, for much more organic models, you know, things that had would have a curved kind of shape, it would be more useful. But if I wanted to change the edge color here, what I don't want to do is this. Get in here and try and color it like a coloring book and get the edge. That's going to be not the smart way to do this. So what is the better way to do it? Um, let's start making a plan for this. Uh, we can use the UVs here to help inform this. So for instance, I'm going to come over here and let's uh, get rid of some of this stuff. There we go. And so now I've got this paint and I want to make the, I don't want it to be yellow. Some of the materials are way more complicated than others. If I select the layer, down here we have channels, color, metal, roughness. Look familiar, right? Remember those from Unity, from Cinema 4D, from literally everywhere. Um, and then normal and height, we'll get to those. Um, but we have the same kind of thing. And so if I want this paint to be a slightly different color, you know, I can come in here and adjust the color of this paint to something I would want. And then I'll grab this brushed metal and drag it over here above that, creating another fill layer. I'm going to delete that test paint for now. We're not going to need that. And then this layer is blank, and I'm going to delete that one. And so now, uh, one of the most popular techniques in Photoshop is creating a mask, right? You mask out layers as you composite them. This is the mask situation for your substance painter is very similar. So um, 
I've got the metal on top, I can right click and add a black mask. And so when I do that, the metal has gone away because I've, I've masked it out completely, right? And so the, the way the mask works is black is hide and white is show. This is exactly like Photoshop or literally any other program that has masks, in it, right? Essentially, it's an alpha channel on, in Photoshop, it's an alpha channel on an image. Here, I said it was like Photoshop and I lied to you. It's actually like running six copies of Photoshop at the same time because not only do we have one layer for color, we have layers for color, we have layers for color, metal, roughness, and height. Four at the same time. Okay. And this list can expand or contract depending on what you need. Um, and so this is the one thing that's most different from Photoshop. At the beginning here, it makes sense because we're just looking at the base color. But I could also look at the metallic stack. I could look at the roughness stack. I could look at the height stack. Let's come back into metallic, or the color rather. Come back into color. Cool. And so now you have to be careful about whether you've selected the layer or whether you selected the mask. Okay. If I select the mask and paint white in here, I'm revealing the metal. If I select the layer, what am I going to paint? I'm going to paint whatever material I currently have selected. And so, you know, if I select this other paint here, and I uh, actually it won't let me do that because this is a fill layer, not a paint layer. So that's good. Um, in this case, we want to have the black mask selected. And really, what I want to do is select this edge stuff here. And so I'm going to come over instead of painting with the brush, I want to come over here to this menu, this menu, and this allows me to select polygons for the mask to make them white. Uh, and so polygon fill, if I start clicking on them over here, right, so I can when I'm selecting or when I'm painting, I can be selecting over here or over there. So I can I can draw in either place. Let me come back. I accidentally changed this. There we go. Now it's back to metal. Um, so for instance, I can click over here to select this polygon to re be revealed in the mask, or I could come over here and select this polygon to be revealed in the mask, right? So this is another issue with UV maps, is in general, you want the UV map to make sense, that when you look at it, you have a general idea of where on the mesh you are. Pretty easy in this instance, but it can get more complicated. We can make this a little bit easier by switching to mesh, or sorry, uh, UV chunk. UV chunk allows me to fill in all of the connected UVs over here, right? So UV chunk, the other word for this is UV island. This would be a separate island. This would be a separate island because they are not connected in UV space. Because remember, UV space is separate from 3D space. In 3D space, they are connected. We made one connected platform. But over here, it is separate islands. Um, and so we go to UV chunk, right? So select mask, select fill mode over here, select UV chunk. And let's just grab all of these, not that one, over here. And now I'm able to very cleanly select all of those edges, everything that I extruded previously, so that now I get green in the center of my platform and brushed metal 
on the edge. Notice over here, all of those polygons I selected in the UV view are white, right? Which is why that they are now revealing the metal that's over there. This is going to be a workflow that we'll come back to again and again and again, is that we will um, reveal, yeah, you know, we'll use the mask to reveal a fill layer. We'll save this. Again, we have the same sort of situation. We're going to save a Substance Painter file, which is an SPP file, but we are going to export textures. So this is our platform paint. And let's bring this, let's get this out of here. So what do we send out of Substance Painter? We're going to, the mesh does not come out of Substance Painter. The mesh stays the same. So the mesh comes over here so that it can be painted. And then our materials are, are rather a whole material in the form of separate textures comes out over here. So we're going to have a texture for color, roughness, metal, height. And these will go into Unity. Over here, let's do that. So we'll save, we saved it. And then we come over to File, Export Textures is the important one. This is the great part about using Substance Painter, one of the nice things, is that there are many templates down here. Substance Painter is designed to work with Blender, C4D, 3ds Max, Unity, Unreal, all of the programs. This is why Substance Painter is used throughout the industry. You can paint in Substance Painter and then send that model to any other program, really. Um, and that makes it super useful. How do you send it to that model? Because they already know what format that program is expecting the textures to be in, and they've made a template for it. And so here, what are we going to use? We are going to use the Unity Universal Render Pipeline Metallic Standard. Okay, this is the one that we want. Again, remember that spiel I went through about URP? That's important here, again, because if you're going to use a different render pipeline in Unity, you would want to use that appropriate preset. But here, we just want to use um, Unity, Unity Universal Render Pipeline. You get it. I can't say it right now. Unity Universal Render Pipeline Metallic Standard. There we go. And, ba -ba 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 -ba. and uh, we can say where it goes. You want to make a folder because it's going to make several textures. So I'll make a folder. This is going to be platform. Textures. There we go. Select folder. So I told it where to go. I told it what template to use. And then you can say export. It'll chug, chugga, chugga. And you'll see it will spit out some textures. Let's go into that folder. And here's what we get. We get three things by default. Right, right now, at the beginning, I think we'll always get three. Um, we get the color. That looks like you would expect, right? The 
metal parts are metal, the green parts are green, makes sense. Over here, this one may be a little bit confusing uh, in that we had, in Unity, we have separate controls for metalness versus smoothness. I just talked about this, right? We can have a smooth metal or a dull metal, a smooth plastic or a dull plastic. Um, again, the overarching principle here is that we are doing real-time rendering. And one of the root ways that they make this faster is that they combine uh, textures. So the metal can be controlled independently from the smoothness, but then in the format, they start to put them together into one image file. So this comes back to the idea is that you need to start to thinking you need to start thinking of images as data. Okay, we can in a regular color image, the one that you're familiar with working with, we have at least three channels: red, green, and blue. Right, and in each of those channels, we have information about the brightness of the red pixel, the brightness of the green pixel, and the brightness of the blue pixel. However, it's just a data structure. It's really just a spreadsheet of numbers, and those spreadsheets are kind of layered on top of each other, one for each channel. In a regular image, you can also have a fourth one called alpha, right? And that controls the see-throughness of it. However, you could use those that data to control things besides the brightness of red, the brightness of green, and the brightness of blue. You could use it to control the metallicness the smoothness, the height, all of these types of things. So let's bring these in. I'll go over to the textures folder. I'll grab these and I'll drag them in. That's good. And so I've got these here. Now I need to put the textures always get applied to a material. And so we need to make a new material to put these on. I'll make a new one here new material. We'll call this platform. We'll spell it correctly. And in platform, I've got platform selected. I need to populate my textures. And so the color goes on the color. Here, let's uh, put the material on the mesh so that we can see it happen. I'll delete that. There we go. So I've just applied the material to the mesh. Remember, this is the mesh that I brought, the one that I brought in here is the one that I brought into Substance Painter. And so it has the same UVs. That's key. So I'll apply the color. Boom. See, that does a lot of the work there. Right now we're able to change that. I'll take this one, and if you look at the full name, it should say, yeah, it has both metallic and smoothness in it. And if you notice, I'm not sure if you noticed before, you see how color has its own input slot. If you look very closely, metal and smoothness only have one. This is that issue I was just talking about, where they took both of those pieces of information and smushed them into one texture file. And so now I can take that map and dump it into here. Looking better. The last one is the normal map. We'll talk more about this, but this is going to look bumpy or changes in height. I don't think we'll see too much of a difference here with this one, but I can, I want to drag it into the normal map slot. And usually it says, hey, you need to fix it, which is that you need to tell Unity that this is a normal map. And so, because um, look what happened. Now we see that fine detail that was on in Substance Painter in Unity. And when I fix it, it should look even better. There we go. And so now, super high fidelity 
looking model that we made in Substance Painter is in here in Unity. Some of these things can be adjusted a little bit, right? So you could tint the whole color channel. In general, don't do that. That looks like garbage. Uh, if you need to change the color, you would want to go back to Substance Painter, change color, and look good. The only, the only time you would want to do that is perhaps if you made the object white and it just had bumpiness and height information, then you could adjust it in Unity, so on and so forth. Um, the metallic map, you see that you can adjust the smoothness, but that fine detail is still there. And so like you're dialing up and down the spreadsheet of data that is there for the smoothness, and then the normal map. We should see some of the normal map here, like obviously this one divot right here, right, that appeared as part of it. If I go back to the material, which is here, platform, the normal map, um, in general, don't adjust this, okay? Uh, but you can, there's a reason there's not a slider here, is that they're discouraging you from doing that. But if I press five, you see it really turned that up, right? Now the that subtle detail is really turned up to the point where it's kind of artistically irritating, right? This actually just stopped looking good. And you can only push this so far. Like if you dial the normal map up too far, it really starts to break the system and things will really look uh, not great. So we usually wanna keep that where it was. If we want these divots to be more pronounced, again, that would be a change that we make back in substance before we export. In general, we're tuning the look and feel of things in substance and then bringing it back into here to use. Cool. And so now we have a good looking, high quality game asset here that we can easily you know, this is obviously going to be a platform that we would use multiple times in our game, right? Um, and so we would turn it into a prefab, right? And then go from there. Uh, but we've got something that looks uh, good. So a lot of new stuff today. I'll put the other introduction to C4D up on the assignment so that everybody can see that. Um, there's a lot more to think about here in Substance Painter, but uh, you, you can get a lot done in Substance Painter just focusing on what we did just with this object, which was you know, using materials and then masking out those materials where you want them to appear on the mesh. There's all sorts of other fun things that we can do here, but we can get a lot done um, just using that. Let me further explain this image as data idea. So if we come in, I'm gonna get rid of the, or actually I'll just cover it up. I'm gonna make another blank fill layer. And we'll call this test. There we go. And I'm going to turn off the paint spray. There we go. So now the part in the middle is just blank. And it has different channels. Color, metal, roughness. Over here under color, here's where I could change the color of that fill layer. I could go ahead and dial in a specific color. Or down here, we can drag a texture or a shader onto this channel. Up until now, we've only looked at materials. We have materials, we have smart materials. These are materials that do slightly more complicated things. We have smart masks. You don't need to talk about that right now. We have filters, uh, just like in Photoshop, right? All of your standard Photoshop tools are here, blur levels, curves correction, right? Those are 
kind of the main things, right? Contrast, um, those are the ones that, if you know how to use those, you can fundamentally manipulate the image on any level. We have brushes, um, lots and lots of brushes, just like in Photoshop, these function very similar to Photoshop brushes, where they can be a very, very complicated spray of things or not. Uh, we have alphas, alphas kind of work with brushes or they can be separately. And then we have um, textures. Textures can be applied to any channel. And so for instance, if I came in here and grabbed, um, you know, there's lots of patterns that we could adjust. And then there's also, you know, lots of stuff like just grunge, right? So if I put uh, one of these patterns on the color, like so, there we go. That fills that in and I can tile this to adjust this, right? And right now it's just on the color. I could also use maybe a grunge, which you, you know, for more noisy kind of things, usually this is not gonna be on a color channel, but you see how those get applied to just the color there. Let's go ahead and take that off of there by pressing the X and I'm gonna give it some sort of color. This one could be that way. And then come down here to metallic. What if I applied those things to the metallic? Right, because again, this works just like Unity, where uh, left is going to be plastic, right is going to be metal. When I adjust it here, I'm adjusting all the pixels the same. Okay, when I dial the slider back and forth, it's doing the same thing to every pixel. When I put a texture on there, it's like this texture, now every pixel is a slider. If it's black, that means that, that pixel will be plasticky. If it's white, it means that pixel will be metallic. And so if I took a pattern of any kind, a black and white pattern, something like this, and put it on metallic, now, especially as I mouse around, you can see that the white stripes look metallic, while the black stripes look plastic. Again, all the controls can be adjusted here. And so now I can make this look metallic in one area and plastic in another area. I can turn that off again by pressing X. Let's come over to roughness. Again, independent from metallic or plasticness. And if I put some other pattern on roughness, there we go. So you can see as I mouse around, Parts of it look dull, these parts here. The white parts look shiny. Again, this is independent from metal. Right now it's a rough and smooth metal. Right now it's a rough and smooth plastic. Right, so the thing about metal, one of the most important things about going to the right on the metal slider is the light fall off. The darker parts get darker. This is a property a visual property of metals. You'll see that happening. But I threw that on the roughness channel, and you can see you know, I can tile this. That's pretty cool. I like that. Um, and we'll do this some more. Well, let, let's do that. Let me take that one off. Great. And so we did something on roughness. We did something on metalness. Let's ignore normal for right now. We're going to go down to height. What does height do? It pushes it up or pulls it down based on this slider. So to the right, it's going to go up. To the left, it's going to go down. If I just dial the height up and down, you won't see much happening. You really need contrast in this channel to see the pattern. And so I'll grab another pattern here. Let's get this one. I'll throw it on the height. There we go. Now we see that you know it's like embossed this into the height. It's also gone over into the other part, which we'll get to in a second. But um, the this embossing does not change the topology, right? So we're not making new 
polygons here. We're just, it's a trick. We're just making it look like there's more detail by changing the way that the pixels interact with light. Um, the other important thing to know from an artistic perspective here is that in the height channel, you want variations of gray. You really don't want 100% white or 100% black because it just looks cruddy. Um, it's pushing the technology as far as it goes, and a lot of times it looks bad. And so something that we could do there is fixing that by... Let's go to the attributes, color spaces, no. We'll add an effect. And so I'll come up here, I'll right click, I'll go to add levels, right? One of our primary filters. And the thing that's a little bit more complicated than Photoshop, right? In Photoshop, it's very easy to add levels, um, is that we need to tell it which channel should this apply to. And which channel are we dealing with right now? This is the height channel. And so I'm going to switch it to height. And we get the histogram of what's going on in the height channel. And so if I take these two and move them closer to each other here, you'll see that I can dial this effect into something much better looking and much more tasteful. Right, where now, right here's where it was before. And you can tell it's just, you know, like very dark. And then you're also seeing, you're really seeing the individual pixels a lot when you push it this far, right? And by adjusting the output black and the output white towards the middle, we can dial this into, essentially we're just decreasing the contrast and making it look much more subtle, much more usable as like a good looking emboss. How do we get the emboss off of that part? We gotta go to the height and go to the brushed metal and change the blend mode. This is also different than Photoshop, right? The blend modes are the blend modes. They work the same. You have add and multiply but you can have separate blend modes per channel. And so in the middle, if we change it to, I believe, replace. Nope. I always forget what the blend mode is. I thought replace would do it. I'm in the height. Right, are we in the height? Oh, no, it's probably. No, we're in the height. Does this have a height channel? No. No. There we go. All right, that was a, we'll take care of that later. But now um, you see that the height information is, is uh, restrained to just that part. From an artistic perspective, it is often advantageous to use the same pattern in perhaps the height, roughness, and metallic. Because if you think about it, these things usually go together, right? If you were physically manufacturing this, perhaps it's like a metal inlay, right? In which case you could take the same one. I've lost it now. What is this one called? Fabric circles over. I could search for it, fabric. Yeah, here it is. I'm gonna drag it onto the roughness as well. There we go. And so now you can see how things work together there, where um, the same pattern is changing the height and the appearance of the rough, you know, whether one part is rough or smooth. And that really amplifies the effect, right? Especially as light passes over the surface. makes it that much more interesting. You could also apply it to the metallicness. Fold that one up. Drag that in here. 
Right, so now all three are being influenced by that. And to get this over to Unity would just be another file, export textures, and bring it back in. In Unity, in Unity you could just replace the file, and I would actually update on the material. Um, but we can do that some more. Okay, so a lot today, but you know, we're sort of laying the groundwork. This may be a lecture you need to watch a couple times, right? Especially if this is new to you. There's a lot here, but I'm trying to split the difference between, you know, about half the class that's done this in some capacity before and about half the class that's not done it before. So some of you may need to digest this one several times in order to get going. But the good news is, you know, this, we'll do this, you know, you'll get lots of practice. We'll do this over and over and over again throughout the semester. Sound good? Cool. So lots of new toys here. Um, great. OK, on Wednesday, we'll look at everybody's video recordings of their game. And so this week, you know, you're going to be making the platform. That'll be part of the assignment, right? For those of you that want to get started, if you work along and make the platform, that's going to be part of this week's assignment. I'll probably have two. We'll probably have one where we're digesting the new 3D information, and then a second assignment where we're uh, doing the next iteration of our 2D game. So a lot of the semester will proceed like this, right? We'll overlap the projects. We'll be refining one project while we're opening the book on the next one at the same time. Sound good? All right. Let's talk to everybody on Wednesday.